Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Eunice Mathis. I am the owner of Florida Training Academy and also a registered nurse. In today's video, I'm going to be showing you how to manage an unstable patient who has bradycardia. Um, for most purposes, or especially if you're a nurse, bradycardia is when the heart rate's usually less than 60. However, for ACLS purposes, when you look at your ACLS algorithm, um, American Heart Association recommends that we treat bradycardia when the heart rate is less than 50. As a reminder, someone may have a heart rate that is lower than normal if they are athletic, um, maybe just due to genetics or certain medications. So if a patient is symptomatic, they could be short of breath, dizzy, um, having blood pressure issues, and has a heart rate less than 50, we're going to treat. So I'm going to go ahead and start our scenario. All right, so you enter the room and you see on the monitor that the patient has a heart rate of 42. I'm going to go ahead and pause it just to give you time to think about the processes and who do you want to call in the room. Um, you're going to actually start doing a brief but focused assessment on your patient. And if you don't know this patient's medical history, you're going to start asking questions. I'd definitely be concerned about maybe a recent surgery. It could be blood loss. Um, any medications the patient should be um, could be taken. Could be the LOL, some beta blockers. Um, if is the patient on digoxin? I would also go ahead and start calling my team. And so even though I'm teaching this in silos, as I said in another video, this will be more fluid in the real world, but we're just gonna go through it. We've recognized that our patient has a slow heart rate, heart rate's 42. We're not dropping any beats. So it is a sinus bradycardia. The temperature is 98.6. Once you call the team into the room, what task are you gonna delegate to the CNA? More than likely your CNA or your patient care tech is going to go ahead and get a full set of vital signs. So let's do that now. And according to the ACLS algorithm, the drug, the ACLS drug that we're going to be administering is going to be atropine. Now, previously atropine was 0.5 milligrams and you can give a dose every three to five minutes with a maximum dose of three milligrams. However, if you're doing everything according to the new guidelines, which came out in 2020, you are only going to be giving, you're now going to be giving one milligram of atropine. And so in order for you to administer that drug, you're gonna to have to have a patent IV. And I would recommend having a patent IV that is more centrally located, such as in the left or the right in the cubital area. So once we have that IV inserted and we have a full set of vital signs, right now it looks like our patient's heart uh, is compensating. The systolic blood pressure is greater than 90. So um, we're gonna keep monitoring this, but we're gonna start the IV at least and um, go ahead and hang some IV fluids in case we do need to infuse them later. With the SpO2 being 92%, I am going to, going to go ahead and start some low flow oxygen, maybe about two liters, um, maybe four liters max via nasal cannula, and we're going to continue monitoring the respiratory rate. And again, if I didn't say so previously, our patient is afebrile. So after administering atropine one milligram, and we're going to administer it here at 1736, we don't treat monitors, we treat patients. We want to go back and reassess our patient. And I'm going to pause this really quickly and just try to show you the ACLS algorithm. All right, so the adult bradycardia algorithm, heart rate's typically less than 50 if it's a bradyarrhythmia. All right, and so we maintain the patent airway. Our patient's um, right now on oxygen at two liters. We have the oxygen, a cardiac monitor. We've called for a 12 lead. and We want to consider the hypoxic or the toxicologic causes. And we talked about the digoxin or any other drugs that our patient could be using. This is a persistent bradyrrhythmia. And right now our patient does not have hypotension, but we are monitoring it. The level of consciousness, the person's alert, awake and oriented by three. There are no signs of shock. Patient is not complaining of any chest pain and we don't have any acute signs of heart failure. And so if that is the case, if everything is no, we would monitor and observe. But of course, this wouldn't be a true bradycardia session if our patient didn't start deteriorating. All right, so we went ahead and we gave atropine. We gave atropine one milligram um, because over here it tells you what our dosages are. Atropine one milligram bolus. You can repeat every three to five minutes for a maximum dose of three milligrams. 
What I found in practice is that if atropine doesn't work, um, our patients usually don't, um, their blood pressure start decreasing. So you want to go ahead and be calling pharmacy to get the dopamine or the epinephrine IV infusion. Those sometimes are not on our floors and are not in our crash carts sometimes. So that may be something that you can actually hang later once it arrives, but you can go ahead and call for it. And now I'm gonna go back to my rhythm. All right, so we gave atropine one milligram. There was no effect, but we don't treat monitors. We treat people. Let's go ahead and go back and reassess our patient. Our patient's now complaining of being very lightheaded. And when we recheck the blood pressure, our new blood pressure is... Eighty-eight over fifty, and so we can continue and just wait a few more minutes. But I don't like to see my patients in distress, and my goal is to prevent an arrest. So I can go ahead and draw up the next dose of atropine. But while I'm drawing it up, I'm also going to have my team members who are at the bedside go ahead and prepare the transcutaneous pace. And so over here we have our transcutaneous pacemaker. Um, which will be one of the functions that your manual defibrillator can do. If you've not been taught how to use a manual defibrillator in your ACLS class, your instructor should show you how to do so. But also on your floor, spend time with your charge nurse. Ask if you can shadow rapid response because you, I, I think that you knowing how to run your codes is a part of you being a safe caregiver and a safe provider. And sometimes rapid response may not get to you in time or you could be a traveling nurse and there may not be enough staff, enough well-trained staff so you need to know what you're doing. All right, so when we have those pacemaker, um, those pacemaker pads on, and of course we have our regular, our traditional three or five leads on also, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hit this pacer mode. All right, and so whenever I select the pacer mode, I have the rate set at 70, and I want you to look at something. Every time there's a pacer spike to know that the machine is actually doing what it's supposed to do, we should see this wide and bizarre QRX complex, and we're not seeing this. So even though we have our monitor, our transcutaneous pacemaker set at 70, this patient's heart rate is still about 30. So um, I want to always remind you that you don't treat monitors, you treat patients. And so you want to go back and troubleshoot your TCP, your transcutaneous pacemaker. More than likely, the person may have a bigger chest, or um, they could be larger and we're just not delivering enough energy. So down here we have our milliamps. And again, if this is anything, if I'm telling you anything um, that contradicts what your facility or what your training um, had guidelines have previously told you, I need you to go by what you've been taught, but this is what we use in our training environment. All right, so down here we have our milliamps. I'm gonna go ahead and resume it. We need to increase our milliamps until we have 100% capture. I want to see a QRS behind every pacer spike. Again, right now, our patient's heart rate is about 30 per minute, and that is too low to support, you know, to support life. We don't want it going any lower. I'm going to increase my milliamps. And every time you increase your milliamps, your patient's feeling discomfort because that is more energy that they're going to be feeling. All right, and so right now your patient's probably saying, ouch, about 70 times per minute. But again, we don't treat this monitor, we treat patients. So you're going to go back and you're going to verify that the heart rate is actually 70. And now when you go back and you check the blood pressure and redo a set of vital signs, you should start seeing some improvement. Most patients do not like the transcutaneous pacemaker. Um, it's not comfortable, but it is something that we can use in order to keep their heart rate up and improve their cardiac output until we can either get them to surgery for an internal pacemaker um, implantation or until we can give them the digibind to reverse the effects of digoxin. But this would be what you would do or how you would treat somebody who had a symptomatic, who had symptomatic bradycardia. And then just to repeat this, let's reset. Let's change your heart rate to 30. All right, we're gonna go through this one more time. All right, everybody, we're just gonna repeat this one more time. We have a heart rate of 40. We're gonna assess our patient. They are feeling symptoms such as dizziness. We're going to go ahead and get a full set of vital signs. 
O2 set at 94% is okay, but if you're like me, you just want to, you know, go ahead and err on the side of caution, you may go ahead and put a nasal cannula on your patient. Our blood pressure is 92 over 50, which is extremely borderline because we're supposed to treat whenever it's less than 90 and or if our patients have symptoms and our patients already verbalized that they're dizzy. Our respiratory rate is 14. We're going to go ahead and start that IV and we're going to start running some fluids. Based on the patient's history, we don't want to um, give too much fluid or give it too vigorously because we don't want them to go into CHF. What drug would you be giving for someone who has symptomatic bradycardia with a heart rate of 40? If you said atropine one milligram, you're absolutely correct. Make sure they have a patent IV. If they don't have a patent IV, you want to be preparing to um, do an IO insertion that's intraosseous. And then, of course, for the O2 set, we put on two liters. So I'm going to go ahead and take that off of my monitor, which is an indication that we have addressed that. All right, and so after we give the atropine, if we do not have the desired effect when we go back and reassess our patient, we want to be thinking about the secondary treatment. And for me, whenever I'm trying to prevent an arrest, my secondary treatment is going to be energy. It's going to take a while before those infusions come from the pharmacy. So I won't have dopamine or epi IV drip right now. My patient's heart rate is 78 over 50, and my goal is to prevent an arrest so instead of going with another dose of epi, since epi didn't work the first time, I'm going to go ahead and go with my transcutaneous pacemaker function. Your defibrillator, your manual defibrillator will have most of these same capabilities. You're going to apply the pads. Make sure the, hair, the chest isn't too hairy. If it requires any conduction jelly or um, any ointment, you want to go ahead and put that on the patient's chest. And we're going to turn on our pacemaker. And now you want to troubleshoot your pacemaker because we have set it at a rate of 70. However, we are not seeing a QRS complex or which would, you know, if we are feeling for the pulse, it would be a contraction. We're not seeing on the monitor a QRS complex after each pacer spikes. So we have a disassociation here. So we have failure to capture. The way that we fix that is by changing our milliamps or the amount of energy that's going through the patient's chest wall. And this is when it becomes really uncomfortable for your patients. If you are considering um, any analgesics or sedation, I, I want you to always think about what that blood pressure is. We cannot give pain medications if the blood pressure will not tolerate it. All right, so we're going to go ahead and resume this. We're going to increase our milliamps, and I want you to follow whatever your manufacturer's guidelines are. And now, according to our monitor, we have 100% capture. But we do not, and the reason why I say 100% is because after each pacer spike, you have a QRS complex. And if you were to check the patient's apical or radial pulse right now, hopefully it's going to coincide with the heart rate. You should feel 70 pulsations per minute, and you should also start seeing an improvement in this blood pressure. Now you have bought yourself some time and your patient some time. They can now get to the cath lab in case or whatever um, procedure they need to go to if they need an implanted pacemaker or if you need to draw up some Digimine, if you have an order for that, if they're on Digoxin and you have your dish levels, that will be something you can also consider right now. I hope this helped you understand the bradycardia station. If you have any questions, my name is Eunice Mathis with Florida Training Academy. Have a great day, everybody.